service last week and I wrote down here Friday night then boat of soup. <laughs> Sorry, boat of soup. And I enjoyed what I spoke about the other day at the, the Methodist Church. Because I think it means a lot. If you catch with what, what I'm about to say tonight, I think we can make a difference in your life and your heart because even when I meditate on what I'm about to speak to tonight, I think about tonight. It stirs my heart. But he does. Um, I'm sure you'd be interested in why I say it stirs my heart and why I would speak about the bowl of soup. I think the bowl of soup is very important as we go along because a lot of us have given up our body lives for the bowl of soup. Man, a lot of us have given up things for the bowl of soup. Do you understand the concept of a bowl of soup? And who's ever who's had who's who's soup to fill you up? Sometimes it's quite nice, some soup is nice, some soup is really nice. This you use a lot of bread with it, but the soup itself tastes nice. And you find what we do with our lives, and I think when it comes to addiction and, 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 and any form of dysfunctional behavior, we give up good in our lives for that bonus, for that hit. I'll read the scripture to you just now, but let me, let me get to why it really stirs my heart. That's because I was originally confirmed as a Methodist. Confirmed Methodist, you can for RPS and then uh, in here, and I'm often here about traditional churches, who understand traditional churches, when you understand confirmation, you get you get inducted into you and you've been recognized as a member. If you're under a certain age, you're not really a member yet, you first going to go through the process, attend Sunday school, attend these things, and you do confirmation for a year and become a member. And uh, <coughs> the traditional churches had a lot of power many years ago, Methodist churches, the, the Inkia churches, the AFM churches, all the traditional churches, and over time you found that charismatic churches and the more out there churches started having more pull. You will see, for example, in the time goes by that the church of the most pool is not the traditional <coughs> churches, there is quite a charismatic church, and the youth are flying, a busy church. But be that as it may, understand something, the founder of the Methodist church is a gentleman called John Wesley, John Wesley, have you heard of John Wesley? And John Wesley is one of the founders. He had a brother uh, that founded with him. And um, what had happened was they would be white wigs. If you saw them today, they would have like white wigs in their heads. They would be dressed now with the frills and very posed and the talk and very traditional and, and, and very um, hard, really hard. They liked it. And they were originally part of the Church of England. Church of England, if you know anything about them, it's quite a traditional, very, very traditional church. It makes the Methodist Church look. Charles Play, uh, for example, they don't believe in instruments in the Church of England. They don't use instruments, it's not allowed in the Church of England. So, understand something before there was a Methodist Church, there was the Church of England, or the Anglicans. I don't know if the Anglicans. I see some people nodding. Yeah, I'm talking. And John Wesley uh, and Charles Wesley was his brother. Charles Wesley, Charles Wesley, was his foot. And uh, they were obviously very involved in the Church of England and they were given the opportunity to travel uh, to America, to be missionaries. So obviously being very excited to be missionaries, they were also offered a post to be a, a, a fully working pastor that he decided to go to the missions field, believing that was the right thing for him to do. And uh, he went to the Americas and General James sent him out to America to minister to the colonists and the missionaries of the Native Americans. And guess what happened? Guess what happened to this, this great man of faith? He failed. He failed. This man, this John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist Church, failed at touching the Native Americans. He actually made a lot of maracas. He didn't connect with the people. It says it said that he would um, he refused to pray for the German, but the Germans were not Anglicans. Um, so he made a lot of trouble there. I think his brother himself was actually ostracized, kicked out. Quite a bit of history to it. 
And, uh, but on the way there, he experienced something, John Wesley. And what he experienced, he experienced a group of people called the Mavarians. Mavarians. Uh, he's called the Germans in his journal. He called the Germans Mavarians. Have you heard of them before? The Mavarians? Anyway. Now, the reason these Mavarians stood out for me is that on the way to the Americas, there was a huge storm. Big, big storm. Big, not like that, big storm. And these Mavarians and the, obviously the English guys being Methodist or Church of England, they obviously try to stand fast, stand strong. And he actually documents and says that it was so bad that at one stage a wave came over the ship, broke a sail, and he thought that the, the sea was going to swallow them up. So he got a big fright. But in this he noticed that the Bavarians would keep singing and praising the Lord. And with this mass break, the English guys freaked out. Oh, we're going to die. We're going to die. Oh, wow. I mean, I, I must admit, I think the majority of us would do the same thing. Crap in our pants, do a skiddy. But these guys did it. And when he approached these guys, he said to them, But why aren't you scared? Why aren't you afraid? He said, No, we're not afraid. We're not afraid. We trust in God. He said, What about your wife and your kids? Wife and kids didn't much. Wife and kids did the same. Can you imagine being a, a 10 year old and a mother, and when there's a big storm, they, they, they were not moved. So, John Nemezi was moved by their faith. And when he was in America, it, it, because he's going through such a time as a, a such a tough time as a missionary, he approached uh, one of the uh, the bishops of the Mavarian Church, and he started spending a lot of time with him because he was failing. So he was reaching out. And when he came back from the Americas, he had, he had failed. He had failed in the mission trips. He wanted to leave the church, but instead of giving up, he decided to start spending time with the Mavarian people. And Mavarians were sold out to the things of God. And he ended up with a guy, uh, Peter Bowler. And yeah, very German. And in this, in this time with Peter Bono, a change took place in John Wesley's, John Wesley's life. And, I've, and I've, for, for the fun of it, for, 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 uh, to understand what, what I'm getting at, is this. He, he, I've wrote down what he wrote about what happened. And what happened, the more time he spent in services with the Mavarian people, he said that his heart was touched. He said something happened to him. And funny enough, his brother Charles was an experience just before him. We also had an experience. His heart was touched. So all these years they've been serving in the church, all these years they've been doing their thing and believing that they, they're serving the Lord. They were. They were. But when he went to America to touch people's lives, he had no impact whatsoever. His strictness in the way he was trying to do things caused him to fail where he almost walked away from his belief. But obviously God was ordained that on this trip to the Americas he would see the Bavarian people and instead of giving up altogether, he started serving in this, well obviously he wasn't allowed to share, just meet them on the secret because it's the Church of England, the English and the Germans. And he said this, I'll read what he said and obviously because it's from the 1700s he did speak higher English. General, John Wesley's word with this, I felt, I felt, first he said first, at a service, John experienced a warming of his heart. That's what he said. I experienced, at a service, I experienced a warming of my heart. A warming of my heart. And he said these words, I felt, I felt. He's been a minister all the time. I felt, I did trust in Christ. Christ alone for salvation. And assurance was given me a washing away of my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death reported that Charles' brother had a similar experience. There was a young man that documented and said that if it wasn't for this experience of John Wesley, John Wesley in the history of churches would have just been a footnote. And there was John Wesley, and he went. But because he experienced the touching of his heart, he impacted thousands, hundreds of thousands. He said when he died, there were 100,000 followers of the Methodists. It was actually a mocking word. Just as much Christians were also a mocking word. It wasn't a, it wasn't a badge of honor. Well, they were mocking. They called them the Methodists because they had a method. Like, ooh, the guys are the method. But they had in churches. And what used to happen is because John Wesley was so on fire after this touching of God that they would lock their pews and refuse John Wesley and Charles Wesley the right to come and preach in the Anglican churches. And because John Wesley was touched so powerfully by the Spirit of God and this move and warming of his heart, that he would say, okay, okay, no problem, you don't want me yet, walk out of the church building, and he would stand outside and he would start preaching, and the people would come. And they found it. That's the change. Now imagine, he went to America, and he failed as a missionary. It was so bad, his, his, his brother was going to arrest him for the way he behaved in America. 
Not because they were doing anything wrong, they thought we were doing the right thing. And you go from this scenario to a man that says, okay, you won't be preaching in your pews, I will walk to the outside of people to follow him. So it was always the Anglican church. When he passed away, they broke away and formed the Methodist church. Now, I understand something, there was such a great impact because of John Wesley that people had a lot of warming on their hearts. And the reason the Methodist church is so dear to me is because at the age of 16, I experienced the warming on my heart. I experienced the warming. And I experienced it again later on at another church. And I believe that warming of my heart has brought me to a place, doesn't matter how much I've messed up, I always remember this warming of my heart. And I need to tell you guys something, it doesn't matter how hard you try to read your Bible and do all the right things and sing happy go lucky song, etc., etc. If you don't allow this warming of your heart, you're always going to cry. Always going to cry. Because this, this, this Jesus we speak about, this, this church thing we talk about, is not some pie in the star type of thing. Let me tell you something now, if you guys knew me 10 years ago, those of you that think that I'm talking crap, if you knew me 10 years ago, you would not believe I'll be standing up here talking to you. That was a horrible person. I became that, I was very nice for many years. Mm-hmm. But I turned again. Okay, evil can evil. What we said now. Does you tell me what changed my life? Jericho. Check it, I did the last. I did that on purpose. Jericho was a catalyst. The place was a catalyst. It was a catalyst. It was a place where I came. Where the storms came and the worries came. But yet the Mamarian people touched my life and touched my heart. Because even though there were storms and there were troubles, I kept looking at him. And that's what changed my life. Because if you look at the place, you will not allow your life to change. You won't allow it to live. And not just this place. Any place. Any place. Any place. It doesn't matter where you are. Some of you come from nice places. Those nice places are never enough to change your lives. Okay? Some of you come from five, five, five star houses. Okay? Why are you in trouble? It's not about the place, man. It's about the warming of your heart. It's about the touching of your heart. And what happened was because of the change of the heart, you know, different schools of thought. The one of the schools of thought we enjoy is the thing when it says that when God is completely in control. Okay? It comes from Martin Luther. It comes from... Uh, um, it's name, Augustine. God is in control. But remember, those guys were, were, were aristocrats. They were very powerful people. So, God is in control. That means that you down there because you're full of nonsense. We up here because God ordained us to be here. You predestined. Some of you are meant to be Christians. Some of you are just meant to die. Another, the other experience is the, the one that says that, that it's completely up to you. It's man's will. It's completely up to us. Now the trouble with that belief that's completely up to us, if you notice that we fail many times in our lives, we miss it. We miss it so many times we start using meth and cat and every other type of drug. That's one of the reasons why we're here. And that comes down to choice. It's your choice, your choice, your choice, your choice, your choice. It's all about human choice. Because it removes God out of the scenario. That's what a lot of us do when we come to Rio. It's us. We know. We never know we're never going to touch drugs again. We know we're never going to make mistakes again. We just know. And then the third one, which I'm a firm believer of, it's that, that you work in tandem, you work in hand in hand. So I've had to describe it to you properly. I'd say that, let's say you're in the middle of a, of a, a huge uh, dam, and you're tired, you cannot swim anymore. So what they're saying, if God is in control, unless God really wants to save you, you're going to die. You like that one, eh? So you're drowning, man. If it's God's will, you'll save you. You're drowning. Nice one, man. The other one says this. It says that by your human strength you must swim to the shore. It's your strength. Your strength alone. But you remember this huge dam. It's kilometers wide. It's your turn. So only if you're strong enough. Only if you're strong enough you get to the shore. Otherwise you're drunk. Then the Armenian was an Armenian. The guy was named, I think the surname was Armenia. And they used to have a, 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 a newsletter that the Wesley, the Wesley guys used to, John Wesley used to do. It's called the Armenian. And they believe this. They believe that if you're in the middle of this huge dam or this thing and this, on the shore there's a man, they would throw a rope and say to you, grab onto the rope. Grab onto the rope. And it would be your choice to grab onto the rope. But once you grab onto the rope, he's going to pull you in. I like it. I enjoy it. And I think many times in our lives we have opportunities where the rope gets thrown to us and we're going to choose if we're going to take the rope. And because we don't like what the rope looks like, Yes, I don't like brown ropes, man. Mm-hmm. <laughs> then we refuse. And I truly believe it's like a chess game. That 
When you sit down, you play chess. The nice thing about chess with God is this, that you're supposed to allow yourself to be checkmated, by the way. You're supposed to allow yourself to be beaten. You're supposed to allow yourself to be humble. That's what you're supposed to do. We're trying to to beat him. And I believe this is why I say it's like a chess game. It's because if you don't get it, who's played chess? Everybody's played chess? Everybody has an idea how chess works? If someone makes a move, doesn't matter how much irritated you make me, I'm going to wait for you to move. Yes, that takes long to move. Who was that guy that used to be here? It takes a long time. Woo! It takes a long time. Check the and then he says, it's your fault I lost because you spoke too much. You took too long to move, man, for flip sakes. So it doesn't how much it irritated me. I couldn't make him move. The same with God. We say to God, help us. Help us. And God makes a move. But what about counsel? He's now mentioned that he asked God for help in this way ended up. Let me tell you a story, my friend. I also asked for God in this way ended up. I also asked God for help. That's why I ended up. And God made his move. When you come, you look and you go, oh. Now what? Okay, it's. Now you make your move. What's your move? Walk away. Okay. <laughs> chess game. Get up. You don't like the way movies made. You don't like the movies made. You decide to walk out of the chess game. Do you lose that chess game by default? Yes. You do. You will lose that chess game. Ezekiel 36. Now understand something about John Wesley. John Wesley had to come to the end of himself. Eh? Had to come to the end of himself to make a difference in his life. And many of us sitting here, and including myself, we're not careful. We are far from the end of ourselves. We are fully reliant on the way we think, the way we understand everything about ourselves. We're fully reliant on it. Especially when we start sobering up, we, we feel stronger again. We feel emotionally strong again. Pretty similar. And that's not the right way. You've got to come to the end of yourself in order to make a change in your life. 36, 25. 36, 26. 36, 25. Then I will sprinkle. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you. And you will be clean. Listen carefully. Remember John Wesley spoke. Remember what he said. I felt. I felt that I had to trust and trust in the Lord. And I felt that Jesus, that I've been forgiven. Remember, remember John Wesley said, now watch what it said there. What's the experience that John Wesley had? He said there, that I will sprinkle clean water and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. Moreover, I will give you a new heart. He said, I felt experienced the warming of my heart. I will give you a new heart. And put a new spirit within you, and I'll remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and call you to walk in my statutes, and you'll be careful to observe my ordinances. You will live in the land that I gave to your forefathers, so you will be my people, and I will be your God. When? When? When he sprinkles your key. When? When he touches your life. When? When you experience that experience. And the only reason John Wesley experienced that experience because number one, he came to the end of himself. Number two, he never gave up. He started doing something different. The very people he used to criticize, the very people that he used to refuse to baptize, the very people that he refused to talk to because they were Germans, because they were Americans, so those very people he started going to. So what happened? He started humbling himself. He started humbling himself. You know what? I don't know at all. This was, this was a minister that put you all to shame concerning the word. Every one of you. Combined, all of us combined, we put us to shame. That's how he knew the scriptures. He knew the scriptures well, man. He knew the scriptures well enough to want to go uh, to the Americas and, and preach to the Native Americans. But he was hard of heart. He was hard of heart. And even though he had so much faith, when he was a storm, he was the one crapping in their pants. Whereas these Bavarians, he said these Bavarians, what he noticed was if they were hit over by the English or treated badly by the English or slapped, he said they would fall down, get up, and walk away as if nothing happened. And he watched us. They were humble. He said the way they used to serve. He said the English, the English Christians would not serve. He said they were very served without even asking twice. And he couldn't understand why. And the reason they can do that, the reason people can do that, is because people experience the warming of their hearts. You get touched by your heart. Guys, your life isn't about what you think about. Your life is so much more, man. If you allow Christ, if you allow Jesus Christ to touch your heart, a warming of your heart, the things that you worry about don't matter. The things that you concern yourself with 
don't matter. It becomes strangely dim. You heard that song? And things of the earth become strangely dim. Because we're so concerned about all these things. Everything is so big in our lives. When God is in your heart, when He touches your heart, the concerns of John Wesley had paled in comparison. And it changed. And what had happened in church today, that people polarized on revelation. They polarized on the charismatic movement. They polarized on the Methodist movement. They polarized on the Church of England. All those people had great moves, but then they polarized. Guess what happens? Their hearts grow cold. Many of us sitting have experienced a touch from God. Many of us. Many of us are got a background of Christianity. Many of us. Many of us got a background of Christianity. What has happened? Our hearts grow cold because we grow cold to the things of God. It becomes a tradition instead of a way of living. And I believe those of you that sit here that have experienced it before, if you reach out and call out and allow God to warm your heart, will never ever be the same. And those of you that have experienced it before, God will do it again. He will do it again. He will warm your heart. Let me ask you something. When you have meat in the freezer, you take it out, you just eat it like that. Huh? When does it taste better? When is it? When it's warmed up, when it's cooked. We want to take cold, dead things. We will make a difference in our life. Okay, what I'll do from now on, I'll go to church every Sunday morning. You're cold and dead. I know from tomorrow I'll stop drugging, I'll stop using. You're cold and you're dead. Come to a place of humbling yourself. Come to a place of coming to the end of yourself. Obviously we're missing it somewhere. When I went to that camp, when he gave a warming of my heart, I was expecting nothing. I was trying to organize how I could smell the joint. I want to eat the joint. I want to eat the joint. And even in me being so naughty, that same Saturday night, it came and touched my life. It came and touched my heart. I remember it as if it was yesterday. I couldn't stop crying, man. Just cried and cried and cried and cried and cried. And I walked away from that when I came back. I walked away. And years later, I ended up in another church. And that same set, that same feeling came again at a concert. I couldn't believe it. I was like, what the hell is this concert I'm watching? And I was like, boom, boom, boom. This is not good. Because I'm going to this church. This is not Christian, and the next one. <laughs> exactly, the cold, your heart gets cold. And then I went and I met, I could feel that warmth in my heart like never before. It just warmed me up inside. And my life was never the same again. And then you polarize, you get stuck, you grow cold. Because <clears throat> it becomes about you and your works and what you can do. Instead of about your relationship with the Lord and Savior. If you're stuck, my friend, ask yourself if you have a relationship with the Lord and Savior. Ask yourself if you allowed your heart to grow cold. Because at any given time, if you just change your mindset, you'll meet you where you're at. Some of you in this, in this, in this thing tonight, and you, the song comes on, I'm sitting over there, in there, I'm thinking about what I'm going to speak to about tonight, and actually that one song came on that when the power went out, and I actually felt I, I was moved by it. Meanwhile, I've had a rough week. I don't feel very Christian this week. But yet, as soon as I focus on him, as soon as I realize it's not about me, he touches me. He'll touch you. Where you at? Without him, without him, we're nothing. Without him, we die and it's done. With him, our marriage problems, our kid problems, our job problems, pale. Pale in comparison to what he's doing in your life. You need to decide tonight if you'd like this warming of your heart. It's you that has to reach out. I can pray until I'm blue in the face. I can preach until I'm blue in the face. You decide. You decide what you pursue. You decide what you have with. You, you decide what you look for. Do you think you got it waxed? Really? Do you think you got waxed in you in this place? I like to warm your heart. I like to touch your heart. You understand? Great moves of God right through history came through a person's heart being touched. Even in the Old Testament, Joseph. No one. Moses. Think Elijah, Elisha, King David. Every one of them experienced something in the Lord. If you look at it, when their hearts were warm, their hearts were touched by this God. And that changes the world. And if your world is a mess, he's the one to change your world. A person in the scripture. It's going to write here. It says John Wesley was like a seed that had to die and fall to the ground. John Wesley was like a seed. And we tried so hard to hang on to our lives. John Wesley got to a place where he laid his life down and he just said, whatever people think of me, doesn't matter what people, whatever they think of you, because they turned their backs to him because he went to the Novarian group. 
fertility has a big impact on fetal natural perimetrics in the animal. Something to think about that. And it wasn't about his religiosity and how he knew the Bible, it was about his warming of his heart. Genesis 25, 34, and I'll tell So why do we polarize? Why do we polarize? Why do we grow cold? 25, 24, 25, 24. Mm. I'm going to go with that just to freak you out. I'm start from verse 29. Now Jacob was known as the usurper, the deceiver, Jacob. Right? And so Jacob had cooked the stew. Jacob cooked something. Let's speak about Esau and Jacob, and the twins. But Esau was loved by his father because he was a hunter, he was out there doing his thing. Jacob was loved by his mom, he was a deceiver. And then some of the strengths they get out. So his name, but by the way, Jacob became some other than deceiver. Jacob had cooked stew. Esau came in from the field and was famished. He came in and he was hungry. He came in and he was searching. He came in and he was uncomfortable. He came in and he just didn't feel good. Remember, that's what he did. This guy mean he was just uh, inside. Famished. Can you make him being famished? Hey, we should have something to eat now. He's just like, ah, oh, just put something in my system. Think, think, big picture, man. Think, big picture. So the deceiver has cooked the meal. The deceiver has cooked the meal. The serpent has cooked the meal. And Esau is famished. Hungry. And Esau said to Jacob, please let me have a swallow of that red stuff there, for I am famished. I am so hungry. Please let me have something to cook. It just smells so good. I just, just need it, man. Successful day hunting. Life going well. And therefore his name was called Edom, which is red. But Jacob said, first sell me your birthright. First give me your birthright. And he said, behold, I'm about to die. So of what use then is my birthright to be? It sounds a bit extreme, man. Wow. Wow. <laughs> eh? But we laugh at that, a bit extreme. But come on, think about what you've given up for a bowl of soup. Think. What have you guys given up for a bowl of soup because you thought you were hungry? Because you thought you were about to die? We laugh and we think it's a... Think about it. Think about you giving up for your bag of cat. Or your bag of meat. Or your relationship. Or your family. Think about what you've given up. We look at Esau and we go, oh, that's ridiculous, family should give me food and give up my birthright. What, what are you talking about? We do exactly the same. We do exactly the same. For a bowl of soup. And Jacob said, first swear to me, so he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. And Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew and he ate and drank and rose and went on his way. Happy go lucky, one for quick satisfaction. Everything's fine. And he went on with life as if nothing was wrong. And remember what happened towards the end when he was blessed. He came there and he said, he said, what about, what about this and what about that? And he said, no, no. And he said, he's done me twice. He's deceived me twice. And he wanted to hunt down his brother Jacob. <coughs> kill his brother Jacob. And it's the same as us. We give up our birthright. We make mistakes. And when things go wrong and consequences come our way, we wonder what the hell's going on. But as soon as Esau repented, as soon as Esau repented, it says when Jacob came back, he put people in front of him because he scared his brother. And when he came, he thought Esau was going to kill him. And he said, Esau killing him. He said, I love you, man. I'm not going to kill you. He said, Don't, what's all this stuff? This is a gift for my master. He called, he called Esau my master. And, and he said, no, 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 I've got more than enough. I'm perfectly fine. I have more than enough. So choose to decide today what your brother's soup is number one. Look at your brother's soup. You give up your brother's soup all the time. For example, let you a good example. Six months of rehab minimum. You want to give up that time for a bowl of soup. Because when Christ is in your heart, and Christ is in your heart, the things you're concerned about, worry about, is nothing from Christ. He is bigger than you and understands something. We believe if we make a move, God will make a move. And no way, no way, no way, if you in this thing with God, there's no way that He won't make a move. And that move again is to protect you and to love you. You're the one that walks away from the world. You're the one that walks with the Lord. And as you play this game with Him, this game with Him, your heart will be warm. And as your heart gets warm, you will see clearly enough to make good decisions. You have the grace enough to get through what you need to get through. But don't you dare give up that opportunity for that 
Father God, I want to thank you for your word. I want to thank you for your spirit. I want to thank you that we hear what's been said. I thank you that you're on here this evening, Lord, on us this evening by warming some of our hearts. Lord. Touching us in a, in, a, in a certain way, Lord, that we just know that we know that we know that we know that we know that you are who you say you are. And we come to realize and understand that you are the God in whom we can trust. That we don't have to rely on our past or what we're about because we fall short in so many areas that you've cleansed us of all unrighteousness. We stand before you cleansed and whole and as white as snow. I thank you that you reign upon our lives. I think you no longer will be deceived into giving up things for a bowl of soup for one meal, for one, just one meal. No, no longer, no longer us. Thank you for your mercy, your kindness, and your goodness in our hearts. Thank you for all that you are in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.